And I love Psalm 121 that this comes from. It's so good. Such an encouraging scripture. And I love that I look up to the hills from which cometh my help. And that really speaks to prayer, going to God in prayer, because he's the one from whence our help comes from. Yes. Amen. Amen. Good morning. My name is Angela Bradley, and I am one of the pastors on staff here at Stone Creek Church. And it is a privilege and a pleasure to be with you this morning. Pastor Ricky wanted me to tell you a little bit about myself and some of the things that I do. And here at Stone Creek Church, part of my responsibility is to be the community engagement pastor. That means that I oversee all the ways that Stone Creek engages with our community and meets all of the needs around us, as many as we can. And so that includes our food pantry. I've been working in that for the last 14 years. And our food pantry meets right here at the church in our cafe every second and fourth Friday of the month. And that also includes our Thanksgiving Big Give. That's been going for some years now. Uh, last year, we set out to serve about 1,450 families. And God said, I'm going to do you one better. And we served over 1,900. That's a God thing. And our latest venture is our Adopt-A-School program. And in the Adopt-A-School program, we as a church have adopted Urbana Middle School. And what that means is that we are wrapping around that school in prayer, and we are blessing those, those teachers and the staff. And our latest things that we're working on right now are to create programming and this new entrepreneurial venture for students. And we're looking for opportunities to grow them and have programs on the lunch hour and after school if any of you all have skills that you can share with the students. And so I have a lot of fun here at Stone Creek Church, lots and lots of fun. I've, had a, I've been really enjoying the last 21 days, uh, our, our 21 days of prayer. We are at, I think, day 11 now. But the prayer meetings have been off the chain. Has anybody been to any of the prayer meetings? They have been just wonderful, especially the evening prayers. I have to admit and say that those are some of my favorites. I love the evening prayer. But we have prayer available at 7 a.m., noon, and at 6.30 each and every Wednesday during this time. And so also want to let you know that we have prayer available throughout the, the next 11 days in our church, in this room, you can come and pray anytime between 9 and 4.30. This room will be open if you'd like to come and do that as well. And so I unashamedly want to inspire you to pray even more. I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know what your prayer life is like, whether it's non-existent or it's fervent or it's kind of dried up or it's eh, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But I want to inspire you to do it even more. As I was preparing to do this message and preparing to write this message, I started to think about prayer in my own life and how there are some things that happen in my life that would never have happened without prayer. Prayer is a powerful means. Prayer is this preordained pathway by which we can commune with God. And so I want to tell you something about my story. My husband and I, when we were married about a year and a half, we had gone through a ton of things in that year and a half. During that time, I had been sick every single month in and out of doctor's visits. In that time, we had gotten pregnant. In that time, we lost that baby on my 25th birthday. And then five days later, we had 9-11. And stop doing the math in your head. Just stop right now. <laughs> stop it. Stop it. A month to the day later, my husband, who had been uh, had this amazing job, this world-renowned company. That company got bought out, and it was in a small town in Ames, Iowa. And so when that company got bought out, he told them, he said, you know, I just got my master's degree. He's like, you know, a lot of the, the people here, they're townies, and they can't get another job, and I can go somewhere and get another job. So, you know, if you have to let somebody go, I'll be the first one. 
That's my husband. And so they took him up on that. (laughs) He was the very first person let go. And so there we were at that year and a half mark, and we were looking for the next step. What were we going to do? And we had been so disappointed over time. And so he would look for a job 18 hours a day. And then when he got off the computer, I got on. And so I found this place called the University of Illinois. And when I did some research, I saw that they had all of these kind of cool programs that I thought that he would enjoy. And I told him about it. He got excited and he applied for those programs. And then he said something to me. He said, he said, Angie, I don't want to just apply. I don't want to just have my name on a piece of paper. I want us to drive out there and I want them to meet me and look at me in my eyes. I want to shake their hand. I want them to know that I am serious. He's a great man. And so that's what we did. We got our little bit of severance pay, scraped it together. We rented a car and we rented a hotel room and we drove out here to Champaign-Urbana. And so he had two meetings set up. On the first day he had this meeting set up and he came back to the hotel and he was like, "Eh, it was okay, you know, it wasn't super encouraging. And so the second day he had a meeting scheduled with the Illinois MBA program. And they liked him, and he liked them. And they, but they told him, like, you know, we like you, Joe, but, you know, your scores need to be higher. Your GRE score to get into graduate school needs to be higher. See, we had taken that test. We didn't even know he needed to take the GRE to get into graduate school. We just applied. And so when I saw that there was a test available, it was the last day. He had never studied for it, and he had he hadn't eaten anything, and he took a three-hour test. So. The scores weren't that great, right? But when he came back to the hotel and told me that, he said, I don't know if I can get a higher score. If I spend all this money that we don't have paying for this test and I don't get a higher score, then what? And so he said, you know what? Never mind. Let's just pack up our stuff. Let's just go back to Iowa and I'll find a job somewhere, somewhere. And so he packed some things up and he took the bag and he went outside. And I was just sitting there on the edge of the bed, just stunned. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to help him. You know, he was so down, I didn't know what to do. And I said, after a few minutes, I said, well, let me, let me just get up and, and, and start packing. Maybe, you know, I can, I can be a good wife and just help him. He, he's ready to go, okay, let's just go. So I got up and I'm heading to go pack when all of a sudden something happened that has never happened before and it's never happened since. And I did not hear the audible voice of God. I felt his voice in every cell of my body. I felt his voice. And he said this to me. God said this, don't leave until you find a place to live. And I'm thinking to myself, ooh. And I told God, I said, but God, how am I gonna tell him? You know, I'm thinking about the money it takes to rent the car. And I said, Lord, and I just threw up this prayer, you have to help me. Even something that simple as a prayer. And about a minute and a half later, the hotel phone in the room rings. And if you know anything, that's very rare. (laughs) So I kind of let that thing ring a couple of times before I answered and I was like, hmm, after that experience with God, I don't know who's calling me. So finally I catch it and I, and I pick it up and, hello? And here's the second miracle. It was my parents. Parents don't call newlyweds in the hotel. Just saying. <laughs> second part of that is that my parents had been divorced since I was nine months old. 
And they weren't always on friendly terms. They would come together to help the children, but they wouldn't just be on the phone hanging out. And here they were on the phone, hooking me in in the hotel room. Okay, hello? And they're just so chipper. My dad says, so how's it going? And I'm like, it's okay. You know, I'm sad, I can't get my voice. And he said, well, well, how do you like the city? I'm like, it's nice. And then my daddy says this. He says, well, you probably better find a place to live before you leave. (laughs) The very voice of God. The very words of God. I can encourage you, some parents, you can be the voice of God to your kids. And then my father says to me, he says, well, I tell you what, I'll pay for your rental car so you can have it another week, and I'll pay for your hotel. Just get a hotel with a kitchen so you don't have to eat out every night. And when I relayed that story later on to my husband, he sat there for a minute and then he started laughing. He said, that's exactly what God said to me when I was out in the parking lot packing up the car. But I was so heartbroken, I couldn't hear him. And I said, God, if this is you, tell Ange. And I heard the voice of God. Now, could any of that, any part of that, have happened through human means? Could we have flunked that up? Could we come up with ideas to make that happen on our own? And I tell you this morning, we could not. It all started in a parking lot, not even in a church pew somewhere. It started in a parking lot with a prayer that one heartbroken man just threw up to God and God showed up for him in me. (laughs) And then I threw a prayer up too. God, you have to help. Wasn't fancy at all. And then he showed up for me in the form of my parents. How do we get access to that kind of divine help? It can only happen through prayer. Prayer is a preordained pathway by which we can commune with God. And that commune does not only mean this place where we can go and spend time with God and talk to him and be in his presence, it also opens up the pathway where he can talk to us. Where we can receive from him all that he is and his power and his strength and his ability and his direction. Because he can see farther than we can see. He is the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is the God who was and is and is to come. And he can show us things about our lives that we cannot figure out on our own. He can do things that we don't have the power and the might and the strength to do. I love this quote by Andrew Murray. He's this 19th century writer. And he says this. He says, when I work... I work, but when I pray, God works. Who needs that this morning? Mm, mm, mm. (laughs) And I can tell you that through prayer, you will meet people that you never would have met. Through prayer, you will go places that you never would have gone, and you can do things that you never would have done. And so today we're going to look at a story that speaks to this power of prayer 
And in this story, it is all together way past natural, way past what humans could do. There couldn't be two people who were more farther apart than the people in our story. And there's like, actually back then, no legal way that these two people could have met. And it was only because of prayer that they had this encounter with God. They were far apart geographically, 30 miles, which was a lot back then. They were far apart racially and culturally. But as they got closer to God in prayer, God could manifest his will in their lives and in this world. And so our reading today will come from Acts chapter 10. You can utilize the Bible that's in front of you. And if you don't have a Bible, you are welcome to take that one with you. It's our gift to you. You can also access this through our app and through you, the YouVersion app. We'll start in Acts chapter 10, verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. And the definition of that is he gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He said. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now, Send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. And he told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey, and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. So sometimes when you get distracted when you pray, it's okay, God can still use you. Don't act like that don't happen to you. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance and he saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. It's like being a parent, you know, if you're really hungry, you eat anything. But all those items in that sheet were things that by law, a Jew could not eat. So he knew that all his life. It wasn't just like a fad diet, like, oh, don't eat this, eat that, don't eat that, eat this. By law, they could not eat all of those things that were uh, in the vision for Peter. And Peter said, surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times because he was hard-headed. And immediately, the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. And while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, Three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to them, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house 
to be his guest. That's a miracle. Jews were not supposed to even invite somebody into their house that was not a Jew. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together all his relatives and close friends. And as Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. He said, stand up. I'm only a man myself. We're both players in God's story. And while talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me through prayer that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? And then Cornelius began to tell him his story. Verse 34, then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. And while Peter was still speaking these words, so what he did after he realized that God accepts anybody. He began to speak and tell these these Gentiles about Jesus. It was the first time any Gentile had ever heard the story, the gospel, the good news about him. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Every bit of this story was a miracle. These were two men who should never have met. This was a miracle. You know, the book of Acts is the story of what happened with believers, Jewish believers, after the death and resurrection of Jesus. It tells the story of like, how did people live? What did they do? What was going on? And so from chapters one through nine, everything that you read about that in the, the miracles, everything that happened, the Holy Spirit in chapter two coming upon the people and they began to speak in tongues, all of that happened to Jewish people. And here in chapter 10 is the first time that that barrier that was around God, that was around the gospel, that got broken wide open. And Jesus was now accessible to anybody who would believe. And that gospel could be preached all over the world. This is where it started. How we are sitting in here today, a church of many nations, many ethnicities, that's where this started at. Because it was a God idea. God wanted all of us to be in here this day. He didn't want it to be just one people group. He wanted us to all be one in him. That was his plan. And you think, how did all of this start? This thing that started there and continues today. It started with two men getting down on their knees in prayer. And when we look at it, we look at Cornelius a little bit more closely in verse two. We see that we need to have two types of prayer, a 3 p.m. prayer and a 12 noon prayer. Cornelius was praying at 3 p.m. 3 p.m. was the predetermined times for Jews to pray. Although he was not a Jew, he was trying his best to align his life with Jews and how to seek God. 
And so he prayed regularly. When we look at verse 2, we see that he gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. And then one day, and can I highlight that for you? He gave and prayed regularly. And then one day, he gave and prayed regularly. And then one day, Verse 4 tells us this. It says that your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. What that means is that God accepts all of those prayers. Our prayers can have a cumulative effect. That as we pray, it builds on one on top of the other. And even things that you have prayed about maybe 15 years ago that maybe you forgot. God has never forgotten about them. He still holds them close to his heart. He remembers everything that you do for him. None of it is lost. And he's saying to us, every time you pray, I see you. Every time you pray, I see you. Earlier today, after the first service, I went to this room for a moment to myself, and I, I, I test as an introvert, believe it or not. And so after being you know, around everybody and the, you know, doing the sermon, I needed a moment to myself in the dark just to kind of gather my thoughts. And I went into this one room. I was trying to find an empty room. I went in this one, and I turned the light off, and all of a sudden, the tears started flowing. And you might ask, like, why are you crying over the lights going off? I was in a room that used to be the prayer room. And in that room, I had spent many, many days of regular prayer. I was praying for the food pantry because I felt inadequate to lead it and to guide it. I didn't know how to do it. I felt like maybe somebody could do it better. And then I had this crazy dream to, to have a Thanksgiving big give, and I, I could see it in my head. I didn't know how to make it happen. People told me that, oh, that's kind of a dumb idea. You shouldn't spend all that time and money on that one thing. And so what I did in my inadequacy, I spent time regularly with God. I wouldn't even go into work until I spent at least an hour praying because I needed to get strength to do what I needed to do. And in that time, I began to pray and ask him to help in these ministries. And I began to pray over all of the people that would come. And so when I went in that room this morning, I realized that I had prayed regularly and I'm walking and living in my one day. God opened up and answered everything that I had prayed over those regular times of prayer. And so I want to let you know this morning that those times that you spend with God, he sees them and he answers them in his way and in his time. And they don't go just nowhere into the, the atmosphere, but they come up before God as a memorial. And so we need those three p.m. prayers, but we also need what Peter did. Peter prayed at noon in verse 9. And noon was not one of the predetermined times of prayer. What Peter was doing was he had a few minutes. And he was like, ah, I'm not going to get on Instagram. I'm not going to get on Facebook. I'm just going to throw it up to God. I'm going to take the minutes that I have in between something else, and I'm going to spend it with God. And God used that moment to change all of our moments. What can God do with your moments? All of us are busy, but you have some little gaps in there on your way somewhere, in the morning when you're brushing your teeth, before you go to bed at night, while you're waiting for something to happen. We have moments. Jesus died for you to access him in those moments. That was why he suffered and died, so that you could have a clear way and a clear path to come to God. We're not good enough to seek God, but Jesus was. And so he died for that opportunity. Now we have this clear path that we could come to God. Before, with our sins, we couldn't even touch God. We couldn't even touch him. But now the pathway is open. What do we do with those moments in our lives? 
What is God wanting to do in your moments, in your life? We, all of us, have to stop trying to go it alone and figure out how and figure out when and where with our own ingenuity. I believe you're smart, but you're not that smart. News flash. I believe that you're creative, but you're not that creative. There are some things that God can do in this earth that we could never think up in our human means. It only happens through prayer. What do we do with those moments? What could God do with those moments? Remember, that commune with God is not just something that we do with him. It's something that he does with us. One more pantry story. Years ago, when I would be the person to go into the Eastern Illinois Food Bank and purchase food for the pantry on that morning. So the morning of the pantry, what I would do is I would go in and my goal was to get like fresh produce and bread and anything that I saw that would be good for the families that were getting ready to come in. And so, you know, I, I went in there, but then before I went in, I threw one up to God. I had a noon time prayer and I said to God, I said, you know what, Lord? I said, I'm going in here, but you know who's coming to this pantry today. You know what they need. You know what they like. You know what they want. Guide me in my shopping to pick up something that somebody could use and it'd be a blessing to them and they'll give you the glory for it when they find it. And so I went in there like normal and I'm just gathering stuff, gathering stuff. I hoard. My name is Angela and I hoard. I get as much food as I can. They, they, they get very nervous when they see Stone Creek coming because I'm going to suck it all up. I'm getting it all out of there so I could give it, so I could be generous to the people that are coming to our pantry later on that day. And so I'm getting stuff as much as I can. And then one of the workers before I left came up to me and he said, Angela, hey, I've got these cases of yogurt. Would you, would you like to have some of this? And I said, sure. I don't get yogurt too often, give it. And I took everything back to the pantry that day. And then I'm kind of watching it, kind of not, you know. And then toward the end of the pantry, you know, I'm cleaning up. And one of our, my coordinator, Helma Mers, came up to me and she said, Angela, did you see that lady who came and took all of that yogurt? I said, oh yeah, yeah, I saw her, I saw her. She said, Angela, that lady has cancer. And she said, her son has cancer too. And the only thing he will eat is yogurt. Only through prayer. That breath you just took, there's a purpose for it. That heart beating in your chest, there's a purpose for it. You're still here. Those watching online, there is a purpose for your life. There are things that God can only do through you and that he wants to do through you. And how do you get to that purpose? How do you get and walk that life out? Do you get it through, okay, um, maybe the best step for me to do, it doesn't come through that way. You get God ideas through God. When you access the supernatural through prayer, he sees all, he knows all. And you were not meant to live this life on your own ingenuity with your own ideas. That's why some of us are so stressed right now. It's because we are trying to figure it all out. And we're saying God can handle some of these things and I'll handle some of these things. I don't have to go to God in prayer for those things. I mean, it's just, it's, I can handle that. Stress. <laughs> Ask me how I know. Mm. 
And so when Pastor Ricky asked us, I think it was last week, he said, Lord, he said, begin to pray for God to give you a hunger for prayer. I prayed that prayer with him when he prayed with all of us. And do you know, the Lord gave me the hunger and I began to pray more, more of those thrown up prayers all throughout my day about big things, about little things, seeking him, and he guided me. And that's what he wants to do for all of us. He died to give it to you. Take advantage of it every day, all day long. Everything that comes your way, throw it back up to him. Everything. You know, this weekend we are celebrating the life and the contribution of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And a lot of times when we think about him, we think about you know, his activism and we think about his I have a dream speech. And rarely do we think about the dark moments in his life where he almost gave up. In 1956, when he was 27 years old, he was elected to be the president of the Montgomery bus boycott. And during that time, he received 40 death threats a day. 40. And so this one particular day at 2 o'clock in the morning, he's praying and he's like, you know what, God? How can I get out of this and not hurt the people? I know they need a leader and I don't want them to be scattered, but I don't want it to be me. I need to get out of this. What do I need to do? And he says, and he writes in his autobiography, he says, at that moment, God came into the room and began to speak to me. And Dr. King says that God told him, stand up for truth. Stand up for justice, and I will be with you. Three days later, sure enough, they kept their threats, and they bombed his house, and his family narrowly escaped. But when he heard the news, He had this unshakable peace in his soul because he had had a moment with the Holy Spirit. He had prayed and God met him. And I can tell you that God wants to meet you. He wants to meet with you regularly. And he wants to meet with you spontaneously throughout your day. Won't you invite him in? Will you stand with me this morning? We never like to close a service without giving you an opportunity to pray. And so I'd like to invite our prayer team to come forward. If something spoke to you this morning and you feel like your prayer life has been dry or non-existent, or not what it should be, it feels mundane and routine. God wants to reinvigorate it for you. There's life in his presence. There's peace in his presence. There's joy in his presence. And he wants to manifest himself even in a new way in your life. He wants you to come to him. He died for you to come to him. And if there's anything going on in your life, in a few moments I'm gonna dismiss, And there will be those who go out. But if you just stay in the pews just for a moment, our prayer team is trained and would love to pray with you and for you right here, right now. And even this prayer, even this prayer has a cumulative effect and God receives that. And I'd like to invite you to do that. Also want to invite you again to our Wednesday prayer, 7 noon and 6.30, regular times of prayer. And I also want to invite you to begin to talk to him throughout your day. He died to be your God and you to be his people. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you, Lord, with thanksgiving and praise. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your sacrifice and how you died to make a way 
that we can be with you. So we can live this life the way it's truly meant to be lived, with you and for you and through you. Lord, do your will in our lives. Have your way. And I pray for all those here and those watching, Lord, for super abundant miracles. Do super abundantly above things that we could ask or think. Do more for us, God. Do more through us. Touch this world through us. Yes, Lord, even us. Have your way, Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.